So everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Ashley gloystein Platt. I'm the VP of Marketing for AgeMark. Um, I was just talking to myself before, so sorry about that for y'all. Um, we are really excited you're joining us tonight for this webinar. Um, our presenter is Erin Druin. We're really excited to have her. Erin um, is a executive director at our Country House location here in Omaha, Nebraska. That's where I'm located here. And um, has worked for Country House for four years. Before that, she was the state development director for the Nebraska Alzheimer's Association. So she's a certified education provider for the Alzheimer's Association, does presentations like this mostly in person all the time. So I know she's really excited to talk to everybody and we're excited to have her. So go ahead, we are doing this webinar style. You can see us, but we can't see you. So what I'd like you to do is um, if you have a question at any time during the presentation, go ahead and put it in the chat feature or the Q&A box and we will get your question answered. Um, we will leave time at the end of the presentation for questions at that time if we don't get to it during the talk. So um, again, really excited to have you join us and I will go ahead and throw it over to Erin. Well, as Ashley shared, um, I have been working as a executive director in a memory care community for four years now. Um, so both from my experience as an executive director, but also my own experience in, in being a caregiver for somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia, I know that the holidays can be extremely difficult. It, the holidays are, are difficult sometimes at like the best of times. So, um, you know, tackling the holidays when you are supporting somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia can be even more difficult, which is why we are hoping that we can offer some guidance and support in the coming few weeks and in the next few months to, to help make the holidays as successful as possible. So we are gonna go through our presentation tonight, which is dementia caregiving during the holidays. Our learning objectives for tonight are ultimately to discover um, pre-holiday planning and communication considerations that are going to help ensure that your loved one's um, needs are both met and considered, that we are, we're hopeful to be able to identify activities and opportunities to engage and involve the person that you love throughout the holidays. We are going to map out the logistics of the day and try and help set up for success. Um, we are going to decode behavioral triggers and learn how to avoid or navigate them and then review gift suggestions and ideas for the person you love. Sometimes shopping for um, somebody living with Alzheimer's or related dementia can be difficult. So we are excited to, to be able to walk through what that might look like for our families as well. So ultimately, as I already said, the holiday season is really tough, right? That we have, um, and, and supporting somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia, it, it presents some really unique obstacles when we're trying to figure out exactly what the holidays are gonna look like. It is really important to remember that we absolutely cannot expect the person living with the disease to recall holiday expectations um, or adapt to the changes in their routine. Uh, so we need to meet that person where they are to help plan for what the holidays are gonna look like for all of us. And then it is also important that we accept that the holidays are going to be different um, than they might've been in the past, that we help prepare for the emotional components of navigating this holiday season and exactly what they're gonna look like now that we do need to make changes, amendments, and alterations to what our expectation for the holiday season is going to be. So this is a question that I've been answering for a long time now, either through my work at the association or now, um, you know, um, as the executive director in a memory care community. So we get this question all the time, right? Whether or not that person living with Alzheimer's or dementia should be included or, you know, to what extent they should be included in our holiday celebrations. This is a really difficult decision to make. Um, we encourage families to discuss it with those in their care circle, not just family and friends, but also, you know, if the person you love is living in a care community, talk to the people that work there, gauge how the, exactly how they feel about whether or not it would be appropriate for them, for that person that you love to join you in your home or, you know, 
travel for an extended holiday celebration or say overnight on Christmas Eve, talk to them about the what what that could look like for the for that person living with Alzheimer's or dementia. Some things to consider when you're making that decision, uh, meal and sleep times. Can you accommodate leaving the community without uh, too much disruption to their normal routine? You know, maybe you know that mom takes an afternoon nap and um, it's not feasible to bring her back to the community that she lives in, but could you set her up a space where she could still take that nap uh, and, and allow for that routine not to be disturbed or, or, um, you know, cause too much, uh, disruption in what that day looks like for her. Uh, medication administrations, uh, is there somebody that's going to be available throughout the day or the evening or the celebration to provide those medications at the times that they are going to be needed? I encourage families when they're taking their loved ones out for an extended amount of time, like a holiday celebration or overnight, you know, if you're, if, if you're planning on having your loved one join you, like I said, for Christmas Eve or something like that, I encourage families to set reminders for medication administration. We all have every intention of, of making sure that we do that, right. Of making sure that we get mom or dad or husband or wife or the medication that they need and then life kind of gets away from us and um, those medications might not be administered on time but for a lot of our folks that are living with a cognitive deficit those those medications really do need to be passed in a very timely manner so i encourage families to set reminders on phones or clocks or timers or whatever you use to kind of keep track of your day include those medication administrations um, in in that in that process so that you can ensure those those are passed in a timely manner. Incontinence management. Um, this is a really difficult provision of care for a lot of family members. It's difficult to support uh, a spouse. It is difficult to help mom or dad with this provision of care. So I encourage families to consider whether or not they are comfortable providing that care. Um, and then making sure also that you have a mechanism in place that will prompt you to be really proactive in managing this, this provision of care. So if mom is infrequently urinary incontinent, do you have a process in place that will cue you or prompt you to ask mom, you know, to use the restroom every two hours so that you can help her be proactive and use the restroom rather than having to be reactive in, in assisting getting cleaned up maybe after we've already had an accident. So making sure that you have somebody that is comfortable navigating that care for that person you love will be very important. Additional things to consider. So adjusting plans, right? Because maybe our traditional celebration just truly is not feasible anymore. Years ago when I was working at the association, I had a family who was incredible at navigating this whole thing, but they had said that once they started caring for mom um, and her disease had begun to progress, that they knew they needed to involve her somehow, but they couldn't involve her in all the things that, that were still important to them, the kids, there were seven children. So all the things that were still important to them um, you know, during the holidays. So they used to tell me that they would have a Thanksgiving after dark and a Christmas after dark. So they would do the celebration with mom and the, the younger kiddos, and then they would make sure they were taken care of. And they would, uh, you know, on Thanksgiving, they would go out and do some of their shopping and they hired a driver and they would, you know, have drinks and still do the things that they wanted to do to celebrate as adults, but they would have that celebration earlier in the day so they could still engage mom. And I thought the idea of Thanksgiving after dark was really cute. So is there a way that we can adjust our plans and still meet some of what we want to be able to do um, and still accommodate mom in making the celebration comfortable and appropriate for her. So after the fun, exactly what is returning to the community going to be like this? Now, when we say return to the community, we mean return to your care community. If mom or, you know, if the person that you love is living at, uh, you know, in a memory care community, what is returning going to look like? Um, is someone going to be available to drive him or her back? Have you considered who that person should be? If they're staying 
if they're staying overnight because it is Christmas Eve, you know, um, planning for that extended leave from the care community are things that should be considered or discussed as well. And then weighing the benefits, uh, do the pros of including your loved one outweigh the cons of disrupting their routine? Um, this is a really, really difficult uh, question to ask yourselves because what we believe is important for, for that person that we love uh, might not be the things that are important to them for them any longer. I had a family recently that had told me um, dad who they were supporting has had more and more resistance to showering. It's not a provision of care that he is any longer comfortable with. He doesn't want people to help him. He doesn't understand why he needs to take a shower. And this is a really common obstacle that families supporting somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia face. And the family had said to him one day, Dad, you cannot come home with us anymore if you do not shower. Um, you know, it, we're not comfortable bringing you if you home. We really need you to shower before you before you leave the property or leave the community that he was living in, rather. And guess what happened? He didn't want to go anyway. It was overwhelming for him to attend these events. And, um, you know, it was he was like so excited that not now, not only did he not have to shower, but he also didn't have to go to these family dinners that were like incredibly stressful for him. Um, it was a huge deviation to his routine. He didn't understand why they were eating at a different time. It was loud and chaotic. And so they had to readjust plans, right? Like um, the, the benefit for him ad attending the, the family dinners, um, he didn't see the benefit anymore. They weren't enjoyable for him anymore. They needed to, to find other ways to connect with him that would be a more appropriate. So weighing the pros and cons um, of making that decision about including or, or how much we can include the person we love will be incredibly difficult. Um, I would tell you again, if you are supporting somebody living in a memory care community, would really encourage you to reach out to the people that are working al alongside your loved one every day. They would be able to offer insight about whether or not that trip or participation in that event would be positive or beneficial for that person that you love. So please reach out to them as an additional resource. After we've made our decision, we also have to work to prepare ourselves, right? So we have to be really comfortable with whatever decision we've made. Um, I encourage caregivers when they make this decision to please be kind to yourselves. You have to trust that you are doing what is right and what is best for that person that you love. Um, don't feel bad if you can't if you can't bring them home for that 30, 40 person get together because chances are um, if you made that decision, it probably wouldn't have been successful for them. Trust that you will find other ways to connect with them throughout the holiday season, even if it means that they can no longer participate in that big traditional meal or celebration. Make lists and timelines. Um, consider your existing, the existing schedule for the person you love. So again, when we are looking at, you know, somebody that maybe has really significant sundown syndrome um, and the evenings are difficult, an evening meal might not be what will, what could be successful in this situation. So those are things that would need to be considered. I always encourage families to spend time showing the person that they love pictures of family attending holidays, celebrations before the big day. So there's two benefits to this, right? One, you get to spend that time reminiscing with them in the weeks before talking to them about the people that will be involved in the celebration. But secondarily, it gives them the opportunity to maybe be able to recognize, put some faces with names, or even if they can't remember names, maybe they'll still recognize faces and know like, Yep, I don't know exactly who that person is, but they're my people, right? Like my family and I should be comfortable with them. So there, that definitely serves a dual purpose and I would encourage families to, to do that. Expect setbacks and be flexible. Um, these things that we, we always have the best laid intentions, right? We make plans and uh, backup plans and all of those things. And sometimes even our backup plans don't work. Um, over the summer, I had a, a, a 
son who had reached out to me and he had said that he was getting a big award um, a, a, in, in the community and he really wanted his mom to attend. His mom's in his in her 90s and I and he asked me if I would please bring her to the lunch and I was one honored that he would allow me to do that but um so excited for her right to be able to see see her son get this momentous award that that he has worked so hard for throughout his entire career and the day of the event came and there was no way I was going to be able to take her. She was having a terrible day and I knew that it would be disruptive if he, if he went. So we had to make these last minute changes and, um, we ended up streaming the, 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 the award ceremony live. And I wasn't even really sure if she was going to be able to take in what she was watching or, um, you know, uh, really be able to recognize exactly what was going on, but she did, uh, watching the, the, the presentation with her was wonderful because it gave her one, an opportunity to ask me questions about stuff that was going on. And we could talk about the award and the history of, you know, what merited this award. And we were able to watch videos after of some of the work he had done in the community. And it was really powerful, right? But it's a lot of adapt at the last minute and figure out the thing that works best. So you should expect, expect setbacks and we have to be flexible. Um, I also encourage families not to take on too much and to please, please ask for help. Uh, whether it's from the community that your loved one lives in or uh, family and friends, you know, if it's a few hours that you need somebody to hang out with that person that you love so you can go grocery shopping, you know, uninterrupted or whatever it needs to be, wrap presents or please ask for help um, because it is a really hard thing to manage and take on on your own. So when we are looking at communicating our holiday plans with that person that we love, um, I encourage families first to discuss holiday traditions and ask them what is going to be important to them when considering these traditions, because like I shared about the, the gentleman that didn't want to go to his family dinners anymore. Um, those ideas of what is important to them might change. Maybe you're really, really worried that they're still going to want to cook that huge Thanksgiving dinner because it's what they've done their whole lives. You know, like I can't imagine mom wouldn't want to do this because she's done it for 30 years. She's the matriarch of our family and all of those things. And then come to find out, uh, you know, the last few years that mom cooked at dinner was really stressful to her. And she's looking forward to a Thanksgiving that she doesn't have to do those things or, you know, uh, a Christmas morning where she doesn't have to get up at six o'clock in the morning or five o'clock or three 30 in the morning when my kids usually wake up to open presents. Like maybe those things are, are no longer important to the person you love, but it, it's worth asking. Um, and again, when we ask about, you know, mom, talk to me about the holiday traditions that you believe are most important. It also gives us an opportunity to connect and reminisce. Um, you might hear stories from when she was a kid that you've never incorporated in your holiday celebrations, but what, what a treat that we get to consider how we can honor those traditions now. So ask. Um, be time sensitive. What I mean by this is for the, for the most part, if, if you are supporting somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia, telling them that we have plans that are going to take place three weeks from now, it can be really difficult. So, um, you know, usually we encourage families, if you are planning on say, bringing mom to your house for Christmas Eve, and she's going to stay overnight, Telling her three weeks in advance that that's the plan is probably not going to be successful for mom because what is going to happen is mom is going to perseverate on being ready for that evening. She's super excited about it, um, really looking forward to it, but it comes with anxiety, right? It's a deviation from a routine that we've built and we're comfortable with. So instead, uh, what, what I would encourage families to do would be maybe to let that person that you love know 24 or 48 hours in advance, give them enough time where they feel like they have a little bit of time to plan and ask questions, but not so much time that it is all consuming. Over the summer, we had a family 
with us in our at our country house community and they were really really excited because they were going to be able to take mom to a, a, a flower festival that takes place here in nebraska and they had let her know at the beginning of the week that she would be leaving at the end of the week and that sweet little lady packed her bags about 600 times between that week, the beginning and end of the week, because she wanted to make sure that she was ready when her family got there. She didn't want to miss this opportunity. But in doing that, um, she packed her bag 600 times, which meant that 600 times we had to tell her that it wasn't the day she was leaving. And that can be really hard. So giving that person you love enough time to plan, but not so much time that it consumes everything else they do um, would be really helpful to that person. Offering reassurance that heirloom and important traditions are maintained. Um, this is something that I encourage families to do because a lot of times when we're looking at supporting our older generations and our families, they feel an obligation to preserve and uphold family traditions. Um, they feel obligated to uphold those traditions. So sometimes if we can just say, you know, mom, you have spent 50 years cooking your very famous pecan pie for Thanksgiving. And I know it's really important to you and, and I'm going to have you help me or I'm going to follow your recipe or whatever it is, but you don't need to worry about that. Let her know that you understand how important that is, but she doesn't need to worry about it, that it's going to be taken care of. That's really powerful. Um, and then the last thing is to identify small and meaningful opportunities for the for that for your loved one to contribute to the preparation. So again, if you're, you know, if you're supporting your mom living with dementia and she has been the one that cooked and hosted for years, um, maybe having her there the day of would be difficult or chaotic, but maybe she can come over the day before and help you prepare the desserts, whether it's making cookies or pies or, you know, uh, Maybe you take out your all of your best china for your holiday celebration meal. Um, maybe having her come over the day before and help you take that those plates out and wash them and set the table. Those are powerful and meaningful things that allow the person that you love to feel connected to your holiday celebration. When we are communicating holiday plans with family and friends, it is really important to set up time with your family prior um, to discuss your expectations for interactions with that person living with Alzheimer's or dementia. And what I mean by that is, is letting family know, you know, um, mom, mom is gonna be attending our, our Christmas morning breakfast and it might be a little bit confusing for her, but my, my goal is to have her you know, there was there with us that, that morning. Um, it's also important to use very concise language about what the disease progression looks like, right? So saying things like, I need you to understand that, uh, you know, Betty's disease disallows her to clearly or logically think through things all the time. And sometimes her behavior is going to be unpredictable. Using those words so that they really understand that there might be components of this that will be difficult for them too, but it allows them to feel better prepared. Um, and when they're better prepared, they'll be able to support that person better too. So communicating what your goals are for engagement and what the expectation is will be helpful as you move through planning for the holiday season. Consider sharing examples of how the disease will impact interactions. So you, as their caregiver, are the person that is with them day in and day out. And you should be able to share really tangible, real life examples of how to navigate difficult situations or interactions with that person you love. So, um, you know, we have a little lady that lives with us and she's pretty ornery. Um, but still really, really, really loves being helpful. So I tell family when they come, if they're trying to get her to do something and she doesn't want to do it, if they can just word it in a way that it is a, that she's doing them a favor, she will happily be participatory. So if we need to get up from the living room couch and go sit in the, the kitchen because or the dining room because it's time to eat and we are really sure that that's a very stupid idea because sometimes, sometimes we are. Um, Letting that person know that 
that you're, that they're doing you a, you know, a favor that you would really appreciate their help with whatever you're trying to get them to do. So sharing those types of examples, those types of language will help others navigate conversations and interactions with that person living with dementia. And then encourage introductions. So this is something that I feel so very strongly about when we have people come into our community. Um, even if it is somebody that visits their family all the time, if I'm walking down the hallway with them and I'm talking to that family member, I might knock on a resident door and I'll say, Hey, Betty, your daughter, Jane is here to see you. And Betty might say to me, you idiot. I know that's my daughter, Jane. And that's perfect. Right. Because she knew it was her daughter, but on that one day where she doesn't know or remember Jane, I've saved her. Right. I have given her the opportunity to know that Jane is her daughter. Um, and she's not on the defense because I haven't made her feel like there's somebody standing in front of her that she should know. And in that moment, she doesn't. So encourage family beforehand to let that person living with dementia know who they are, even if they, even if you're fairly certain they are going to know. So, you know, a lot of interaction or a lot of introductions, even like, Hey mom, it's your son, John. I, you know, I'm so glad to see you today. She probably knows who John is and that's wonderful, but there's a lot of people and a lot of commotion and she's likely going to be tired and maybe a little bit overwhelmed. And so John giving her that out of, yep, it's me, John, um, that, that can be really helpful in navigating this situation. So encourage all family members to prepare themselves for making that initial introduction and they might have to do it more than once. And that's okay too. finding ways to, um, include their name or their relationship to that person living with dementia throughout the conversation will be helpful. So when we're looking at explaining dementia to family members and friends, there are some things that I encourage families to remember or consider. I know again, when we navigated, um, a diagnosis in my own family, it kind of felt like it went one of two ways, right? Like you either that per that family member either was like, well, it's an, they're just getting older. You know, I heard that we heard that a lot, like, well, that's a, you know, ever that happens to everybody forgets they're getting older. Um, or people would just automatically assume that they really couldn't do anything for at all for themselves anymore. And they would talk around them or about them, even when that person was right there. So we want to remind family and friends that dementia is progressive, it's degenerative, and that it's going to impact them more, more than just their memory, right? It's going to impact their speech, their behavior, their mobility. So encourage, I, I encourage everybody to communicate that very clearly with friends and family. Please let them know that dementia is not a normal part of aging. Um, it is really difficult as a dementia caregiver to hear those other folks that are like, huh, I forgot my keys today. Maybe I have dementia too. Those types of comments are, can be really detrimental, um, to what these relationships look like in supporting somebody that's living with Alzheimer's or dementia. So reminding friends and family that dementia is not a normal part of aging. Dementia prevents brain cells from communicating. And as this damage spreads, um, the, those parts of the brain are, are actually dying. Uh, so again, uh, this is not a behavioral component of aging. It is not a uh, mental health condition. It is truly a physical deterioration of their brain. Rational, logical sequencing and deductions are impacted even in the very early stages. So again, let family and friends know that, that, you know, even though mom still looks normal. Um, and she can kind of fake it till she makes it for a while because we're all good at that, at least for a period of time, there are going to be rational and logical impact. Um, or there is going to be, I should say rational, logical impact to how mom behaves and communicates and please encourage families to consider that their sense of self is going to remain intact. Um, even in the very late stages of disease progression, I am a tr very true and fervent believer that we still understand what the expectations are for, um, you know, human dignity and decency. So even though that person is living with Alzheimer's or dementia, they still 
know who they are as a human being and they want to be respected um, and recognized as such. So encourage families to consider that, family and friends to consider that as you navigate these conversations with, with those folks, with family and friends. So positive communication and conversation. So again, please keep in mind that even in the early stages of disease progression, the person that you love will likely have difficulty finding words or they will take longer to speak and respond. I encourage families to know and understand how your loved one prefers to be supported in conversation or in communication with others. So this is what I mean by that. Early on, ask that person that you love how they want to be supported. Say, you know, um, as, as this progresses and you're struggling to find words, do you want me to help you? If, if I know what word you are trying to find, do you want me to help you or do you just want me to give you time to figure it out on your own? Um, that can be really powerful, but it can also help you navigate the, this, you know, this journey, the additional stages of, of disease progression. We had a lady that had moved to our country house about two and a half years ago, and she knew that she had dementia and she was really frustrated by it. She used to ask me a lot, why? She would say, why does this happen to me? This is so hard. So I had said to her when she first moved in, if you are trying to tell me something and I, I know what word you are looking for, do you want me to tell it to you? She looked at me like, are you an idiot? Of course. Like, of course I want you to tell it to me. I don't want to sit here for 15 minutes and try and figure it out. If you know what I'm trying to, to say, then help me. Um, and it has really guided my relationship with her for, you know, the subsequent years, because I knew exactly what I needed to do to support her. She had given me permission to help guide those conversations. Um, to offer a solution in your questions and your statements. So this is what I mean by that. If I, instead of asking somebody, we're about to serve dinner. What would you like on your plate? Um, there's an endless amount of options there, right? I don't really know maybe that turkey is a traditional Thanksgiving meal anymore. Or maybe I don't remember that we've never had turkey and it's always been ham. So instead, we would put the answer to the question in our statement. I'll give you an example. So we would say, mom, we cooked turkey and ham for Thanksgiving dinner. What would you like to eat? Or Maybe if, if I know that she's loved turkey her whole life, maybe I just say, mom, we've cooked turkey for Thanksgiving dinner. How does that sound? So giving her the answers in those questions will allow her to better navigate what her responses should be. Um, it is common for the person to, with dementia to withdraw from conversation. If you see that happening, you can find opportunities to either re-engage them or maybe just offer support. You know, maybe the conversation is going kind of a million miles a minute, but you can just put a reassuring hand over their hand and say, yep, mom, you hear that? What do you think? And maybe she'll just be able to say, yep, that's good. Or, you know, uh, maybe you, maybe it's just a matter of, participating in the conversation on her behalf and sharing contributions that you know she would have shared. So if they're reminiscing about a first trip to a park, acknowledge that mom is there and say, mom, I remember a time when you took me to the park and X, Y, Z happened. So she's still engaged in the conversation, but you haven't put her in a situation where she needs to recall that memory herself. Um, be careful that others don't discuss the person with dementia or their disease progression in front of him or her. This seems like something that all of us should know, but I have seen it happen time and time again over the years, um, in both my role at the country house, but also in my role prior at the Alzheimer's association I always would make me sad because, uh, again, when we consider that that person's sense of self remains very intact. Hearing somebody discuss their disease or them without being participatory in the conversation would be really, really detrimental, very hurtful. 
And then lastly, to ensure that someone can help reiterate or rephrase conversation, um, make sure that person is sitting next to them, whether it's you or it's a cousin that you know is super good with mom or whatever that may look like, but make sure that that person sitting with them can help them navigate those conversations. So, you know, looking for those visual cues to say like, oh, that question, maybe mom didn't hear, or maybe she didn't understand. So being able to rephrase the question in a way that would be easier to answer, or maybe just because the question wasn't heard, being able to actually repeat the question so that they can answer it. Just making sure that somebody is there to be supportive throughout those conversations and those interactions will be very helpful. So the other thing that I encourage families to consider is preparing the space that we are going to be using to have that holiday celebration. So first to consider seating arrangements. So as I just stated, um, making sure that that person sitting next to them is going to be supportive in helping them navigate the conversation. Make sure that the people that they are, that that person that you love is sitting with uh, is people that they will likely recognize will be really helpful. So having mom sit next to a third cousin once removed that she hasn't seen in three years is probably not going to be the most successful way to navigate this this setup or or those conversations you know and maybe that person really wants to sit next to mom because they haven't seen her in that long um but letting them know that you you know that maybe you or like i said uh somebody else that has uh more regular interactions with mom will help steer the conversation in more positive directions um if your loved one uses a walker or cane, making sure that they have adequate space to navigate wherever, you know, maybe we need to make sure that for eating in the dining room, that there is space for them to get appropriately from the dining room to the bathroom unobstructed so that they can navigate that space themselves instead of having to ask for help or, you know, we certainly don't want to fall or something like that. So making sure that the space is safe and appropriate making plans for alcohol consumption and access to alcoholic beverages. So um, it, there are a few considerations here, right? First, we need to make sure that the consumption of alcohol, if you're planning on mom or dad or the person you love having a wine with dinner, just making sure reaching out to the provider to make sure they're not on medications that will have a negative impact or a reaction to alcohol. And then secondarily, just considering that um, just like the rest of us, if there is alcohol consumption in excess and our balance is impacted, we want to make sure that they are safe. So, you know, making sure that you have that understanding of exactly, exactly what alcohol consumption might look like for the person that you love will be important. Uh, if that person, if you have determined whether it's through your provider or just, you know, maybe the history, alcohol history or, you know, issues with that in that, in your loved one's history, and you have decided that they won't be drinking, making sure that that alcohol is out of reach or out of access to that person will make it easier to navigate those conversations because what you don't want to do is let's say dad can't have alcohol because of the medications he's on, but he goes into the refrigerator and he grabs a beer and he's about to take a sip and you have to let him know he can't have it. That could cause a potentially really catastrophic reaction for him. So if alcohol needs to be eliminated, then making sure it's out of reach and out of sight so that we're not put in that tough situation of having to intervene once we've already, once we already have that drink in our hand. Um, prepare a secondary or alternative space to use in case your loved one becomes overstimulated or, or anxious. This is really, really important. So, you know, maybe mom or dad doesn't need to take a nap during the day, but maybe they have these periods of rest where it just needs to be a little bit quieter. Making sure that you have that kind of safe space identified will help make this uh, this event that gathering more successful table placement and arrangement can be overwhelming um i've learned this the hard way uh those long banquet tables where you have 
35 family members, you know, from here to the end, and you got to yell all the way down to the other side of the table for that person to hear you, those tables are not successful in, in, um, supporting somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia. I encourage families in, instead to consider small table pods. So there's multiple benefits to it. One, we, it, it is easier for that person living with dementia to understand where the sound or the conversation is coming from if they can see that person that is talking to them. So if they're sitting at smaller circular tables or pods, it is easier for them to track the conversation and then be participatory. Um, secondly, I mean, when tables are laid out like that, I can't hear what is happening at the end of the table. So we can't obviously expect that that person living with dementia is going to understand either. They are likely going to become incredibly overwhelmed in trying to track 15 different conversations that are happening over that long table. So I really, really discourage families from having those long traditional banquet tables set up if they are having a family gathering. Um, and then lastly, avoid confusing and or hazardous items, candles, artificial fruits and vegetables, blinking and flickering lights. Um, we, I think have learned that hard lesson more than once at our country house, but like the artificial fruits, we're there for a gathering. We know that we're eating and those decorative things are there, but it is hard for us to gauge whether or not they're real or edible. And that's really embarrassing, right? Like we don't want to put that person we love in a situation where somebody has to take something away that we've accidentally bitten into and is not edible. So eliminating those types of things. Um, candles are obviously an additional consideration just because we maybe our depth and spatial perception disallows us to kind of gauge how close that item is to us and it could be dangerous. And then the blinking, the blinking and flickering lights, like those fake candles or even holiday lights that maybe are outside the window, but are set on a, you know, to rotate or things like that. Those are really, really difficult and super distracting to somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia. So I encourage families to either, either set those lights so that they are on continuously or turn them off so that they can't be seen outside the window. So additional preparations and considerations. Um, I always encourage families to pick out a really special outfit with that person that they love prior to that purposeful activity. Um, and then also remember a change of clothes because maybe the outfit that we picked out is beautiful and we're gonna feel so good wearing it, but it's not very practical and we won't be able to wear it for a long period of time. Or maybe, it was a totally appropriate outfit, but during our, you know, Christmas dinner, we spilled something on ourselves and we're really worried now that we have these dirty clothes on. So bringing a secondary outfit will help to avoid uncomfortable situations. Um, if that person that you love does have issues with in, uh, urinary or bowel incontinence and, um, you're taking them out of whatever space they live in, whether it's home, but you're going to your daughter's house or a care community, but you're returning home. Make sure that you have more than enough personal care items to ensure that that, that you know, the person you love can be supportive with that incontinence, those components of incontinence management, because that is really super anxiety provoking and embarrassing if we don't have what we need. Um, if the person you love requires cues for the restroom, again, I would consider setting reminders because I probably a thousand times a day tell myself that I'm going to do something and I forget to do it. So uh, telling yourself that you're going to remember to tell mom to use the restroom every two hours is probably not feasible. Um, there's a lot going on and you know, you're hosting with all of these other folks there and it just isn't going to work. So setting up um, alarms to remind yourself will be important. And then discussing your hopes for assistance with the person that you love um, and setting up kind of timelines or time frames will help other people understand what their expectation is. So, you know, you might say, hey, 
uh, you know, Sally, it would be really helpful if you would spend some, uh, an hour or two reminiscing with mom while I finish cooking and then I'll sit with her at dinner, but Bob, you are going to return her back to the care community before dessert. And you'll have dessert with her there, you know, make sure that everybody understands what the expectation is so that the plan can be, you know, organized, um, the day of your holiday celebration. So when we are considering of environmental triggers, things like loud music and distracting background noise are really, really hard again for somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia. So the loud music, I encourage families to look at like instrumental options. So maybe you have a CD, you know, I don't know, a Dean Martin CD that you have listened to for the last 20 years of your holiday celebrations. Um, but maybe if we're expecting mom or dad to participate in the conversation, the words of the music might be distracting. So consider an instrumental alternative to that. I know at Thanksgiving, a lot of people have the football games on throughout the day. Maybe put those on in a secondary area where the person that you love won't be because the, that, that background noise can be incredibly distracting. Lighting. If it is too bright in that room or too dim, it can cause anxiety or fall. So really being conscious of making sure that the space is appropriately lit so they can navigate will be helpful. Um, I also encourage families, and I we again learn this in supporting a resident at our country house, to close the blinds in the evening hours because sometimes the reflections that we can see in the windows are really confusing. We had a little lady that was very sure somebody was outside her window in the evening hours talking to her. And um, after trying to, we were kind of racking our brains and what exactly we could do to support her and ended up adding one of the glossy covers to her window so that the reflection, she couldn't see the reflection anymore and those people were gone. So closing the, the curtains or the blinds in the evening hours so they can't see a reflection will be helpful. Time of day, again, considering that maybe that person might have, you know, some, uh, some sundown syndrome in those evening hours, maybe we're doing a Thanksgiving meal at noon, or maybe we're going to focus on Christmas brunch, but we're not going to, you know, have that celebration in the evening hours. And then, um, whether you can identify the trigger or not, just offering reassurance and responding to the emotional parts of the statement. Um, rather than the rational parts of what's going on. I, this is something again, that I really love offering guidance about because uh, it's a, it's a 180, right. From like what we've been told our whole lives, my kids are eight and 10 and they come home from school and they're so emotional about something that has happened. And I'll have to say to them, like, please, please stop, like leave out the emotional part. Just tell me rationally what happened. And it's a 180, right? Like we don't, um, there isn't a rational argument most times. So instead we're going to respond to the really emotional parts of their statement, the total opposite of what we've been told to do our whole lives. So instead of trying to sometimes logically or rationally, we won't be able to understand why they are upset, but we can say to them, mom, I can see that you are feeling so upset. I am so sorry that you are feeling that way. Sometimes that is all it takes to just know that, that, that you're next to them, that you care, that you recognize that something has happened, even if you don't know what it is, that something has happened that was incredibly upsetting. So responding to the emotional components or, or parts of their statement will be helpful. So when we're looking at ideas to help engage that person you love, you know, as I shared earlier, help, you know, engage them in helping you prepare the food. Maybe they can't help you cook anymore, but maybe they would love to just be in the kitchen with you and smell what you're cooking, smell the aromas of food that they had prepared their whole lives. Maybe they would still be able to cross off a list of ingredients for you or read a list of ingredients for you. Find a way that you can engage them in, in preparing that food. Uh, wrapping presents, again, um, I, first of all, I would take any help that I could in, in wrapping presents, but that is a really, uh, powerful task during the holidays. So if you can find a way, maybe they can't wrap presents anymore, but they could help you with gift bags, those types of things, finding ways to help them engage in that way. Writing meaningful cards. That's such a huge holiday tradition, right? So maybe you could help them write out the cards. Maybe they can't write them anymore, but they can still tell you what you would like. They'd like the cards to say, um, 
you know, that would be a powerful and positive activity during the holiday season. Offer ideas and opportunities to give back to others. I think this is really important, right? Especially right now, you know, this idea, this month of giving back and they're used to other people giving to them. How empowering and powerful to give them an opportunity to give back. You know, this month at Country House, we have some of our little ladies are making blankets for the Humane Society and they'll go, they'll go drop them off and they'll do their volunteer hours with the dogs and the cats. And um, they've made scarves and they'll go tie them around the trees downtown for folks that are homeless as it gets colder. Those are really powerful way. They're purposeful, right? And there's no human on the earth that doesn't want to be purposeful. Um, have the person you love help with the seating chart. Cause again, there's a dual benefit, right? Um, they get to help with the seating chart, but it will also help them familiarize themselves with who is attending the, the gathering. And then if there is a holiday tradition, your loved one is always cherished, consider beforehand how to help them. So I'll give you an example of this um, from, and this is again, from personal experience. If you have dad who has had this big ceremonious to do of cutting the pie, um, but it has become apparent that we don't know how to do that anymore. Um, cutting the pie beforehand so that dad can still hand it out on the plates would be a really impactful way to help him still complete that task without having to understand exactly how to physically cut the pie. So being able to do those things, consider those things beforehand so that you have kind of set them up for success, right? The pie's already cut. Now he just has to put it on the plate instead of figuring out how to cut the pie. So that would be a really helpful way to honor that tradition that he has identified as important. So when we're looking at returning to a care community after a holiday celebration, I first encourage families to consider your driver. So in all likelihood, if you are caring for mom and she's used to you being there, you might not be the right person to bring her back to that community because she'd be really sad probably about going back or just maybe really tired or maybe she won't be sad. Maybe she's chomping at the bit to get back, but um, it might need to be somebody that there will be less connection to. Plan to go into the community when you get back. So I had mentioned earlier, like bringing that piece of pie back and having it at the community instead of having it um, at the house, that will be helpful in trying to return to the community successfully. And then considering, consider sending a picture or a card to remind them that they attended that event because otherwise, um, you know, expecting them to know that they were there might not be a fair expectation. And then give yourself permission to return early if you need to. The last thing that we get to cover tonight is gift ideas. Um, so we get this question a lot at Country House, like what should I get mom or dad? Um, so we're going to go through this gift idea list very quickly. Um, so first warm socks or house shoes, please make them like grippy if possible, non-slip because that would be the safest possible option. Comfortable clothing that's easy to get on and off. So like those stretchy waistbands, those types of things, um, please, please stop buying mom or dad button fly jeans. Those are <laughs> really hard to navigate. Um, Meaningful art or pictures, uh, photo albums in, or labeled pictures. I always encourage families to label those, those pictures so that they can go through and show others and be really proud of their family without being embarrassed that they might not be able to pinpoint exactly who's who. Busy boxes, items of interest to review or sort. So, um, you know, maybe dad has been like a huge antique car guy his whole life and you could send him back with a, with a, a, a box of all types of old cars, you know, fax names, everything to sort and go through. That would be a really purposeful gift to give to dad. Um, consider CDs or radio. Uh, the ALZ store that it's just alzstore.com has this, they have a whole bunch of old fashioned radios that are super easy to use. Like maybe they just have to turn on a button or, um, you know, it, it tunes to radio stations, but it will only tune to, you know, preset radio stations or things like that. So yeah, we've even had families that have done things like the echo 
dot. And instead of having to navigate, they can just walk into the room and say like, you know, Alexa play Frank Sinatra and it will play. So, um, just anticipate having to type up maybe some direction so that we can remember how to, how to use that. Faith-based items, so large print or abbreviated Bibles, decorative items, or rec recorded sermons. I have a family that over the holiday season records all the sermons at the church that they attended. So it's like the same pastor, you know, she gets to hear his voice like that. I love that idea. That's so powerful. Bird feeders, um, the, the bird feeders that affix to windows are a lot of fun. Some of you will have to help, you know, fill the feeder. So anticipate that obviously, obviously, but those are really enjoyable for folks that are living with dementia. Electronic clocks displaying date, time, and day of the week. Our residents at Country House love those clocks. We just put one up in the front, and I cannot tell you how many of our little ladies have come up and been like, I love this clock. So they, that's a very good gift for somebody living with Alzheimer's or dementia. Large calendars and whiteboards to jot messages down. Maybe we're to a point of disease progression where we know we're forgetting, um, giving them that opportunity to write things down or for you to write messages like, hey, mom was here on Wednesday, because then the next time you see mom, she's not going to maybe give you a hard time about how you haven't seen her in months. So the whiteboards can be really helpful in communicating with that person you love. Um, so ultimately, everyone, the holidays are exhausting. Um, expect that the days following your holiday celebration might be difficult for the person that you love. They're going to be tired, maybe overwhelmed. So expect that that could happen. Um, if you are still caring for your loved one at home, please consider utilizing local respite programs. Um, they might be able to offer some respite hours so that you can prepare for your holiday. Don't and don't forget opportunities to find laughter in what is going on. Um, as I said, this, this, this journey, this disease is not easy, um, but laughter can be really powerful all throughout this journey. So give your, yourself an opportunity to laugh. And then adapting holiday planning to make room for new, new traditions. As I shared earlier, maybe in reminiscing, mom will tell you about this thing that they did at a kit as kids that you never knew about. So maybe there are things that you've done with mom for the last 15 years that you can't do anymore, but it would be really easy to incorporate this new thing. Um, know that adapting holiday traditions will be okay. The last thing that I have here is just some resources that I encourage people to jot down. So as I said, there's gift ideas on that ALZ store website. They actually have a whole list of gift ideas, which is very nice. The Alzheimer's Association hotline, I always list because they're, that 1-800 number has licensed clinical social workers that will answer that phone 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the National Institute on Aging has an Alzheimer's Disease Education Resource Center. You can go to that website and order any printed or downloaded resource for free. Um, it's funded by public and private grant. And then your local offices on aging is who you would contact if you were looking for respite options. So if you would like to find out whether or not there are respite dollars in your community, um, reach out to your local office on aging and they would be able to steer you in the right direction. And then lastly, if your loved one is living in a care community, please turn to them as a resource. They want to be helpful. They want to help guide what is best for the person that you love. So please reach out to them and, and ask for help. All right. So Ash, we, we still have questions. time for questions. Yay. That's fun. You know, we're like right at seven and we totally understand if anybody has commitments and need to jet, we totally get it, but we do have some really good questions. So, yeah. um, first one, um, talking to kids about dementia, cause it's kind yeah. of scary sometimes. Um, how do you suggest explaining that to like grandchildren and great grandchildren before they yeah. see their loved one? Yeah. I, really love that question because as I shared with everyone, I have an eight and 10 year old and they have grown up in this dementia community. And um, some of those conversations are, are really difficult. So first I think communicating that it is um, a disease, that it isn't a choice, right? Helping them understand that grandpa or great grandpa, great grandma or whoever it is 
um, that they have a disease that impacts the, the words that they choose and the things that they say. Um, when, when Kate first started coming to country house, my eight-year-old, she is, well, she's eight now, but she started coming to country house when she, when I started working there and she used to visit with a little lady that lives there. And she tells like the most fantastical stories in the whole world. And she had told my daughter once she had told Kate once that, um, she had grew up on a farm here in Omaha and they raised red alligators. And we were on our way home that day. And Kate said, did she really raise red alligators? And I said, no, baby, she didn't. And Kate thought about it for a while. And she said, so it doesn't matter that if she tells me the truth or not, it just matters that I listen. And I was like, that is perfect. So I tell that story to families all the time, like encourage those kiddos to just listen. They don't have, the story doesn't have to make sense. They can enjoy that the story is fantastical. You know, Kate loved that this, this story about these red alligators encourage them to enjoy it, but, but let them know that, you know, um, all of the stories might not be true, but just enjoy listening to them. Awesome. Okay. We have some, I'm going to read some from the Q and a box. So Marsha says, can you guys still hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Marsha says my mom is 97 with dementia. Lately. She wants someone to always be by her side, whether she's sitting on the couch or going to the bathroom, eating, um, going to bed. She keeps asking us, if we can stay, be right by her side. Um, she's sure this is common. She tries to reassure she's okay. And she'll be back in a few minutes. Um, is that the correct response? She said she often even lays with her at night until she falls asleep. Oh. Yeah, I think that um, there's a few things that, that could be happening, right? Like one, our disease progression has just gotten to a point where even our short-term memory is impacted. So we likely don't know in those moments that somebody has left us how long they have been gone. There might also be changes to her vision. You know, maybe as soon as we're out of sight, um, like as soon as we're not physically next to that person, maybe they really, you know, maybe mom really doesn't know that somebody is there anymore. Um, I would encourage Marsha and her family to, to utilize written communication too. So if you're, you know, if you're going to step out and you're going to be gone for a few minutes, maybe leaving, leaving that note that says like, mom's still in the house downstairs doing laundry, you know, an additional reminder so that she doesn't have to say, Marsha, where are you? Marsha, where are you? Because that is what can happen sometimes. Um, you know, as far as like laying with her at night, we had, we had a family, uh, or we had a resident that for a while it was like that for her. And I, and I do think that part of it was decline in her vision, but, um, we, this, you know, we would sit with her until, uh, she fell asleep. And then one of our staff had filled up like a glove with lavender and rice and would set it on her back after they had walked away and she would still feel like that comfort, like that hand that was there. So sometimes items that offer comfort, like a weighted blanket or things like that might just offer enough comfort or reassurance that, that someone is there. But I would definitely encourage you to utilize written communication as additional reminders. Um, maybe if you are going to be in the house and she is going to continuously ask questions, maybe a baby monitor would work, you know, something that you could still talk to her so that she knows that you're there. Um, it, the hard part of it ultimately is that it, it's exhausting, right? Like having to continuously offer that reassurance. I think that it will be a moment in time. We see that as a stage of disease progression, something that will likely kind of change as you continue through this journey. So know that it won't be that way forever. Um, but if you can find those little ways to offer reassurance in the meantime, then those things will probably be helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, you were talking, one of the first things you talked about was kind of, um, oh, giving people advice not to tell their loved one too early, yeah. you know, happening because they kept packing their bags mm -hmm. or asking, you know, what's happening. Um, yeah. How much, what is kind of the best amount of notice? Yeah, I, what I tell most of our families is that you could let them know the day before. Um, there isn't any expectate. They don't, there's no grandiose planning that they need to do. You know what I mean? Like for the most part, they're not going out and doing all of their shopping. 
um, somebody's going to help do some of those things with them. So I would say if you let them know the day before that you're picking them up in the morning and that you're really excited that they're going to be able to join you for that celebration, uh, then that should be enough time. But I think, you know, for the most part, three weeks is just, um, it's, it, it does usually more harm than it does good. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, this person's loved one, sorry, I wrote down all the <laughs> on page <laughs> on post-it notes. Um, they have a loved one who doesn't want a bath or shower either, but you can't go to a family gathering being stinky. Yeah. Any, um, tips for making that bath or shower happen? Yeah. Okay. So I just had this conversation with another family. Um, somebody, well, uh, it was a, somebody that had reached out actually to do some education. And she had shared with me that mom had not had a bath in 76 days, like how completely overwhelming mom is still living at home. And it is the provision of care that she absolutely hates. So, um, in talking to her a little bit more, she had shared with me that she truly just for mom, it really was like a dignity issue. She did not like the idea of being completely naked in front of anyone, whether it was family or a caregiver, because they had tried everything like hired a personal caregiver and nothing had happened. So we, I had recommended that maybe they buy one of the waterproof clothing protectors that you can order on Amazon and let her wear that through the shower so that it covers the front of her so that you can still help clean the other areas. But the cool part about the clothing protector is it's got a, that little pocket that's supposed to catch the food, but they use that to put like her washcloth in there and her soap. And so that she can still kind of feel like she has some control of the situation. So I think to first to best understand what the obstacle is, right? Like if it really is that she is just, she or he is just incredibly, incredibly, um, it's just the dignity component of that provision of care, then I would try it that way. Um, if they're, if the person that you love is just kind of resistant because, <laughs> because we don't either, we think we did it already that morning, or we don't logically understand why we have to do it anymore, then um, I think that we have had the best success in approaching it from the standpoint of, um, that they're, they're not doing it for them, that they are doing it to help us. Right. So again, when we talk about that impact of identifying that, or, you know, understanding that still that sense of self and being purposeful, we have a little lady that lives with us. She is very, very ornery and she, that is a provision of care she hates. And if I go down to her and I say, listen, I hate to ask you this. I have this thing that I need to get done. And you are literally the only person that can help me with it. I, I really hate to ask, you know, my boss is a making me do this, you know, like, um, can you help me with it? Like I, I can only ask you, there's nobody else that can help me. She'll let me bring her in. She'll tell me I'm stupid the whole way. Like, I can't believe you need to do this. You're such an idiot, you know, and that's okay. But, but she's let me do it because she feels like she's doing it for me right? She's not doing it for her. She's not doing it because somebody has told her to, she is doing it out of, because, you know, because I'm an idiot and I need her help. So sometimes I think approaching it from that way, like, you know, we can't say, mom, you got to get in the shower because you really smell like she might not be able to smell that, or she might not really care, you know, like logically we, it doesn't matter to us anymore that we smell. So finding that way to make to, for our approach to be a positive contribution to us rather than a negative impact on them is a lot of times very helpful. Awesome. Um, okay. You mentioned alcohol and I think one thing I had no, you know, experience with anyone with dementia before starting to work at age mark. I mean, and alcohol can be consumed in like low amounts, depending on their, you know, medication and things like that. But this person is wondering, can they fake it? Can they fake alcohol? Like Ooh, that is a super work? good question. <laughs> so we have a gentleman with us at our country house right now that prefers beer for lunch and dinner. And we would not be able to give him the amount of beers that he, um, would like safely. So we have purchased the non-alcoholic beer and just make sure to pour it into a glass. We, if I gave him the can, he would definitely know. And he would be furious, but if we pour it into the beer glass and it looks like, you know, um, that is perfect, perfectly appropriate. I think if, if, 
if that ceremonious component of still having a beer with our family or, you know, a glass of wine with the ladies or whatever, um, you know, they make a a number of non-alcoholic wine options as well. That would be a totally appropriate, um, you know, a totally appropriate intervention. The only thing that I would caution is if the person you love has a Corsakovs or alcohol induced dementia, then we encourage families to eliminate even a non-alcoholic substitution because it's still habit forming. So if you're, if the person that you love is living with, like I said, a Corsakovs dementia diagnosis, and it is from a long history of alcohol consumption, then I would say that it's, it's milkshake night at your house, but even the non-alcoholic drinks are probably not the best option. Gotcha. Cool. Um, this person is worried about, um, you know, it sounds like it's maybe one of their first trips, um, from their memory care community back home for holiday, mm-hmm. yes. worried about the person withdrawing themselves kind of totally or detaching from the situation. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So I'm, I I'm, I'm going to assume that they mean withdrawing, like during the part, the, the celebration, right? Mm -hmm. Ash. Okay. Yeah. So I think again, we would, we, when we look at, um, participation in that celebration, we're not going to look at it as like one big component. We're going to look at participation in a series of other like smaller things. So, um, I would, if it's the first trip back, I, I would encourage that family to one, spend some time, like I said, looking through the pictures and the, um, you know, making the, the seating charts and those lists, like helping them familiarize themselves with who's going to be there and kind of what to expect. Um, and making, uh, communicating in positive ways about their, experience, um, in the last few weeks in their care, care community or few months or whatever it is. So, you know, maybe reaching out to the activity director and finding out a few things that they've done that they have really enjoyed, you know, maybe, um, maybe mom does really enjoy the, the trips to the humane society. And she's found like great value in volunteering, like focusing on those components of like, uh, in that conversation. So when we're, we're with family and we're talking about giving thanks and, you know, things that we appreciate, make sure to highlight what mom's contribution has been in regards to what she has been able to do living in that care community. Um, finding really positive ways to engage that still tie her residency back in a very, in a very positive way. And then, um, you know, I think that secondarily, like, uh, just making sure that she is given the opportunity to maybe bringing 30 people in for that dinner might not be successful, but maybe allowing her to come um, before that big dinner and have a smaller lunch with like a more intimate group uh, might be beneficial. Or, you know, if, 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 if it's the idea of returning home, you know, maybe you live five houses down from where mom's house was. And you're worried that just simply traveling past there is going to be really difficult for her. I would also encourage you to reach out to the care community and find out if they have space where you can host there. Um, because that also gives her the opportunity to like, maybe show family around, like maybe there's Mm -hmm. stuff there that she would be really proud of. So considering that as an option as well, might be helpful in navigating this first year of, of holiday celebration and tradition. Mm -hmm. And is it sometimes it might not be detachment or withdrawal. It might just be that they sort of are okay, just sort of yeah. and watching. I mean, I guess I remember my grandfather did not have dementia, but he was hard of hearing mm-hmm. and the noise and the stimulation of Christmas got yeah. to be too hard. So he would yeah. kind of turn hearing aid and I would just go by and sit by him and kind of hold his hand and he would yeah. just smile and chuckle at all the kids going yeah. crazy. Is sometimes that okay too? And I think, you know, like Ashley said that we we've talked so much now about just the expectation that their interaction is going to be different. Different doesn't mean bad, right? Mm -hmm. Like Ashley said, he was just as content, just kind of, you know, watching what was going on. But if you have this like gregarious matriarch that has always like led the charge and, you know, it was like grandma that was 
karaokeing up a storm after, you know, and she's not doing that anymore. She might be okay. So watching karaoke, you know, like maybe she's not going to sing, but she's okay watching. And I think, you know, you'll know, you'll know if they're okay. Just like Ashley said, um, it was evident that grandpa was okay. He just, his participation just looked different. Mm -hmm. Here's another, um, question. This person has four sisters. Is it confusing if a different sister comes every day to care for my mom with dementia? I'm assuming mom is in a community. Correct me if I'm wrong there, anonymous attendee, but we are trying to take turns, but we don't want to confuse her. What do you think, Erin? Yeah, I, I don't think that that is confusing. I think that the important, there's two important components to this, right? First one, be comfortable with those introductions. Like I said, you know, make a, a really positive habit of walking in every day and being like, oh, mom, you're stuck with Aaron today, you know? And if she's like, you, you dummy, why did you just tell me that you're Aaron? That's perfect. That's okay. Um, and secondarily, if there is a day where, where, um, you know, mom thinks that I'm Sarah and not Aaron, that's okay too. Like mm -hmm. don't spend your visit arguing or trying to re-identify who you are, just feel comfort in knowing that she continues to recognize that you're her people, right? That, that, that you're okay to be comfortable with, but no, I, I absolutely don't think that it would be confusing to her. She's lucky to have somebody there each day willing to support her. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looks like she's still at home. So she must be in early stages. That's great. Yep. yep. Looks like yeah. Question. Yep. Keep going. Yep. Each day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all of our questions. Those are great. I mean, as you were talking, you know, I was even thinking of brainstorming ideas, you know, if a big gregarious event just isn't manageable for your loved one. I mean, I think there are amazing ways to celebrate the holiday in smaller ways. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, a small lunch at their community or a small lunch at a restaurant or driving around, looking at Christmas lights, maybe things that just aren't quite so stimulating. I think, you know, inviting them over to help you decorate your tree. I think there are so many ways that you can celebrate the holidays, even if it looks just a little bit different. Yep. And again, to just keep in mind that, um, you know, sometimes we'll talk to families and they'll like, maybe the day they move into country house, they'll hand me a list of like four pages that they're like, dad does not eat these foods. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, and a few weeks into residency where we've, everybody's got their plates on the table and dad's like, how come I'm the only one without carrots? You know? And I'm like, well, I was told that you don't like carrots. And dad's like, I like carrots, you know, like things change. What we find value in and enjoyment in is going to change. It is going to look different as this disease progresses. And sometimes there, it might be positive, right? Like, uh, dad likes carrots now. And like, that's, that's wonderful, you know? Um, but just adapting to those changes, um, you know, meeting that person where they are, it, 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 it might look different day to day or, or week to week. Um, but finding still enjoyment in those little, those little moments in each interaction, um, that's what will help to make the holidays successful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody for joining us, especially those of you who stayed late to listen to these great questions. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Aaron, for leading. I, I hope it was really helpful. Um, if you don't already, you know, Aaron mentioned that memory care communities are very much willing to help as well. If you have one of our communities near you, don't feel, you know, too afraid to reach out. We'd love to help or even follow our social media for ideas, different things like that. So um, we really appreciate you joining us. Have All a good right. night, everyone. Have